digital technology, especially, for example, here at um, Bangkok University. Um, so I'll be looking at words like craft, materiality, um, nostalgia, mechanization, and uh, what we do with our hands. Um, <clears throat> Um, this is also an adaptation of a paper, a talk I'm going to be giving in two weeks in China, in Hangzhou, um, about the uh, future of printmaking in a, in, a, in a digital world. And they call it, uh, what is the future of print in a post-print world, which is a little bit complicated. Um, so um, there's growing interest at the same time as there's so much digitization of our lives, there's a growing interest in craft, which is a kind of ongoing dialogue between society and machines and craft. As, as fast as we mechanize, we have a nostalgia for something we're losing. So, Um, this is a recent woodblock print I did. Um, it's in an exhibition at Tabubu Gallery, on for another week. If you have time, please go and have a look, and then you can see my work uh, up front and uh, in front of you. Um, it's three colours, so that's three different blocks, and it's printed on handmade paper. Um, and I've, I've actually got a, a proof of the picture here. Um, uh, just showing you um, how I um, began the print and uh, uh, some of the mistakes I made and so on. Uh, you can't necessarily see, you can't um, immediately see the influence of wood, but we'll look in this talk today at how artists directly show uh, a relationship with wood and for what reasons. <laughs> um, so, uh, woodblock printing in Japan uh, came from China. China invented printmaking. The first materials uh, uh, in China were paper, ink, uh, and um, yeah. so you combine paper and ink print by hand, and that technique uh, spread to Japan. This is a woodblock print by Kikao Utamado, and it uh, tells you uh, uh, part of the, um, part of, uh, an aspect of the printmaking, woodblock print, woodblock printmaking process in Japan. This is in the final stages. You have somebody printing the woodblock print just here with a handheld baron. You've got somebody who's mixing the ink here. You've got a brush here which will apply the ink onto the, onto the woodblock. You've got somebody else printing a picture here. You've got the pictures on display, and this is the shop. This is the shop front, and you have a customer who is looking at one of the prints. This, while it shows you a true aspect of the printmaking process in Japan, it's completely artificial, it's a joke, because women never did woodblock prints. It's um, an amusing picture showing beautiful women doing the jobs of men. Um, in the uh, printmaking process in Japan, um, all the aspects of the process are made by hand. The paper is made by hand, the brushes are made by hand, the, the knives are made by hand, and the wood comes from the trees and is cut by hand. And in the process, you have four uh, craftsmen who make the prints. You have the artist who designs the print, you have um, the, the uh, carver who carves the print in wood, then you have the printer, as you can see over there, who prints the picture, and then you have the publisher, the person who sells the prints. 
So it, was, uh, it wasn't like um, the kind of artistic process we have nowadays, where you have one artist who does everything. Um, so, uh, when uh, Japan, um, uh, when Westerners first went to Japan in about the middle of the uh, 19th century, about 1850, Japan was a completely what we could call pre industrialized country. Um, there were no machines, uh, there were hardly um, any. Uh, horse and carts, as we might think of it, and uh, what the uh, the Western influence into Japan uh, completely changed all that and brought in machinery and woodblock prints fell out of favour uh, 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 as um, people preferred to see photography and um, Western printmaking processes like lithography and etching. So, um, by the beginning of the 20th century, woodblock printing had almost completely come to a halt. And the only people who were doing woodblock prints were those people who were selling woodblock prints to Westerners. So, by that point, 120 years ago, woodblock printing had become nostalgic. Uh, this is a print of Mount Fuji by the grandfather of my teacher. And uh, you can see on the one hand, it's a nostalgic uh, rural scene in Japan. And that's also something that Westerners wanted to see in Japan, something exotic, very Japanese, uh, and uh, wistful and romantic. Um, However, um, generally in Japan, um, woodblock printing fell out of favour through the 20th century. I went to Japan in uh, 1990, and I also went to art school in Japan, and I was one of the very few people doing woodblock printing in a Japanese art school. Most of the students were doing, if anything at all, they were doing uh, what we could call oil-based printmaking processes that were popular in the West. Uh, the woodblock printing process in Japan is water-based and non-toxic. However, in, as I say, in the last 20 years, there's been this huge growth of international interest in Japanese woodblock printing because it's non-toxic. And uh, I don't know what it's like here in art schools in uh, Thailand. Um, I think there's still quite a lot of toxic uh, printmaking going on, but. Um, Generally, in Europe and in America, the use of chemicals in an enclosed environment is now illegal because it's harmful to health. So that's one of the reasons why there's been a growth of interest in Japanese woodblock printing. Um, um, another reason for the interest in uh, woodblock printing, we could say, is is as a response to our digital uh, era, the digital era that we live in. That's something that you're completely familiar with because you're probably all born in the late 90s, I suppose. Um, but uh, the growth of craftsmanship, we could say, is the growth of interest in craftsmanship and woodblock printing, we could say, is related to the changes in our lifestyles. And uh, when I was in my hometown, Oxford, in May this year, I went into one of the bookshops and um, there is a huge display of books about craft, which I think is very interesting. Um, for example, this book, The Craftsman by Richard Sennett, talks about the history of craftsmanship and how it's changing now. Uh, this one is easy to understand. Um, the case for working with your hands or why office work is bad for us and fixing things feels good. 
Um, and the third one is uh, called On Craftsmanship by Christopher Fraden, who used to be a uh, rector at the Royal Academy in London for 20 years. And he says that uh, craftsmanship has again become fashionable, just as it did in the last few recessions. So he relates craftsmanship to recession, economic recession. The concept of craftsmanship has never been as relevant and timely as it is today. And he says, um, craftsmanship is um, eroded by things like flexible working hours, short-termism, portfolio careers, quick fix training, and the cult of celebrity. So those are some examples of perhaps why people are moving towards craft. Um, and a growth of interest in wood as a medium. <clears throat> you might think this is a photograph or a still from a computer, but it's a woodblock print by um, a German printmaker uh, born in 1987, I think, called Christian Baumgartner. And she uses wood. This is a woodcut uh, to, to portray scenes of war and uh, urbanism. So if you see the print alone, you can see it's on paper and it's printed by hand and all these bits are cut by hand. It's not very clear here. However, um, I'm going to look at today more at artists who are using wood, directly referencing wood, so you can see the wood. And uh, it's kind of a, almost a hippie movement, back to nature. Um, We have, as human beings, we have a very, 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 very ancient relationship with trees and with wood. Uh, because we evolved from like uh, tree shrews and apes that lived in trees. So we developed uh, hands, the early form of hands we used to climb up trees and hang from trees. Um, but our hands became more sophisticated as uh, at the point when we came down from trees at some point. And the hand evolved amongst human beings, not, uh, not other primates. The particular thing that hands do is have a thumb that uh, uh, is the opposite, an opposable thumb, so we can grip things quite hard. And this is very important because with the opposable thumb, we could use tools. And by using tools, our brains could develop in the way that they have today. But uh, monkeys and uh, chimpanzees and so on, they, they've got quite flexible hands, but they, they don't have the same flexibility that we have. And our hands developed at the same time and, and in parallel with our brain. So hands are very important, and along with hands, you have touch, and touch is uh, one of our major organs of sense, along with smell and uh, uh, sight. So here's me, this is me doing a woodblock print, uh, and I just showed it here because you can see there's touch involved, and there's a kind of dexterity here when I hold that knife. And then there's a relationship between my eyes are looking very closely at the knife and at my finger. And there's a point where my sight, my eyes are actually feel like they're down here and that I'm, a, that, that I'm the knife. And that this point of contact is very, very important. And that's something you see in, let's say, craft and handcraft. 
It's called uh, the, the organs of uh, sight and hearing and smell and touch are our haptic senses. And we can argue that our haptic senses are not used to their fullest uh, potential uh, when we work with computers. In a sense, with computers, you're basically like this. What you do with the keyboard and with the mouse is important, but it's not as, uh, not as uh, sophisticated uh, or used to its the same potential as craft. Um, this just shows you the different things you can do with your hands that are important. Cupping, cupping, for example, you want to unscrew a jar, you do two different actions. Peeling a banana, how you hold it. And of course, how children learn about the world is through touch. It's the very first sense that a child experiences from the moment of birth. But everything we learn as a child is uh, through the experiences of touch and sight. And when, when a child makes a mark by hand, it's the first time they see durable evidence of what they can do with their hands. It's, it's like when you make a uh, you know, footprint in the mud. It's uh, amazing. And that's, that's a deep connection with printmaking. Um, this is a uh, work by a Czech artist called Jan Schwankmeyer. Uh, and he, uh, in the 1970s, he stopped making films and made uh, a series of installations and objects which were all about touch. And he said that touch and imagination are extremely important and that um, too much, too much uh, utilitarianism can destroy the, uh, the, the, um, the influence of uh, the connection between touch and imagination. So a child learns about the world through touch and imagination. Uh, has anybody been to Rome and put their hand in this? What is it? I've forgotten. Um, um, this is somewhere in Rome anyway, you put your hand in the, in the mouth, but uh, it could be an example of touch and imagination, what's inside the mouth. And um, that brings us to trees, back to trees. And I want to talk now about 10 artists around the world who've used uh, trees and woods, wood as they're in their art. Um, uh, there's a, um, all over the world, in the, uh, let's say, the developed world, um, there's a fear that children just stay indoors the whole time, don't go outdoors, uh, have very, a very poor sense of uh, nature, and um, uh, along with that you have so-called nature deficit disorders. Also, um, nature deficit disorder uh, is accompanied by um, obesity, poor confidence, and lower physical and mental confidence. So an engagement with nature, let's say, could address those shortcomings in uh, the new generations of children. I don't know about you guys, but uh, how often do you go outside? How often do you play outside? How often do you walk? Or how often do you go to the national parks? <clears throat> um, this is the first artist, uh, she's an English artist called uh, Angela Palmer, and she made uh, a series of uh, works about the stumps of tropical, hard, tropical trees. Um, 
after the trees were cut down, she went to uh, Ghana in Africa, and she had the the, uh, the stump of the tree uprooted, and she took six or seven stumps and toured them around the world, beginning in Denmark and Oxford, and then they ended up in Wales. Um, This is one of the stumps in Oxford, my hometown, just in front of the Pitt Rivers Museum. Um, I can't remember what tree it is, but she says the concept of her in a massive installation is that here is the negative space of the tree. This is where the tree once was, and it's not there now. And it's a metaphor, that negative space is a metaphor for climate change. Um, she also uh, invited thousands of school children in Britain to come and touch the wood. That sounds a little bit simplistic, but the idea was to give the children a, a sense of guilt or, or connection to the wood that they see in their everyday lives, and um, it was called I Touch the Rainforest. Um, this is a, um, a work by an Italian artist called uh, Giuseppe Pannoni. It's called uh, Spazio di Luce from two, 2013. Um, it's not the tree, it's a bronze cast of a, a large tree. Uh, what happened is uh, he cut down a large tree and he covered it in, uh, in a wax mold, and hundreds of people came to help cover the tree with the wax by hand. So they're feeling the tree, they're feeling the wax. Then the tree was burnt, and the wax uh, and, and uh, bronze replaced the wax. So this is a bronze cast of the tree. And what you end up with is a, is a, a hole and uh, these kind of finger marks of the tree. And he says that this cast uh, invites us to rethink the relationships of sight and touch, outdoors and indoors, nature and the city. So it's about life, shape and skin. <coughs> Here he is peering through the hole. These are the branches, the, the branches of the tree, but cast in bronze. Uh, in China, this is an artist called Tai Fung, who is the head of printmaking at Han, Hangzhou uh, School of Art. And in 1999, he heard that a huge cryptomeria tree in a national park in China had been cut down. And these trees are thousands of years old. And they're related to those giant trees, uh, the giant redwood trees in America. So they're like, the trees are like national institutions. They, they kind of represent the past of China. Um, it's about uh, two meters across. Uh, and Tai Fung went with one of his students into the national park to take uh, an impression, a print, of the wood stump. And this is the wood print. So it's about two meters across. It's absolutely massive print, using four sheets. One, two, three, four. And he's made a record here of the tree, the name of the tree, uh, its age, and uh, the girth and the type of tree in it. Um, and this won a third prize in a national print competition in China in 2000. So it's interesting that Chinese gave this print of a tree uh, the kind of credibility that you would give an artwork. Uh, this is another uh, artist, uh, American artist called Brian Nash Gill from Connecticut. 
and his art is all about printing from scavenged or dead timber. Uh, and what he would do is um, cut, cut the tree uh, across the end grains to find an interesting uh, series of uh, rings in the wood. And if you, if you realize that uh, each uh, ring in the wood represents one year, you can see how old the tree, the tree is. The rings tell you a lot about the history of the tree. Um, you can also see in the print that he takes, uh, you know, the tree story, uh, where there was insect attack, where the tree cracked, uh, what years were good or what years were bad for the tree. So it's like, as I said, a kind of biograph, a biography. This is a honey locust tree. Um, and when he prints, he prints by hand using Japanese papers. This is a, another uh, American artist called uh, Gaylord Shanilek uh, in Wisconsin. And he did uh, a study, he made a study of 20 acres of Wisconsin woods using and printing from the interiors of 50 trees as a kind of record of the woods around him. Uh, he didn't print by hand, though. He printed uh, through a press. And he used colors. He printed using colors so that he could mimic the colors of the wood itself. And he also cut into the wood so that he could um, accentuate the knots and the rings and the idiosyncrasies of the wood. <coughs> um, this is a little, little project I did in China about 10 years ago in Chongqing, uh, which is the biggest metropolis in the world, about 32 million people. And I wanted to buy pear wood, and pear is what are the traditional woods you use for woodblock printing? Um, although it's uh, too expensive to use these days. But I was told that a farmer uh, in rural Chongqing wanted to sell some pear wood. So I went with one of my students here uh, to buy the wood, but the wood had too many holes, too many wormholes, and it was rotting. So we decided just to take uh, uh, an impression of the uh, wood plank while we were there using Chinese ink and dabbing by hand. And then we strung them up to dry as a kind of instant installation. Uh, this is a uh, Australian, a young Australian artist uh, called um, Um, Chris Sutevsky from Canberra School of Art and this is a series of prints he did uh, through the trunk of an apple tree in his garden uh, printing by hand and he calls them analogue prints even though they're not strictly analogue and this is a, a similar set of prints these are from a section of bamboo which he has cut using CNC. Has anybody used CNC here? Uh, which is computer numerical control, I think. And with that, using the machine, he cuts into the wood to mimic wormholes, mimic a kind of erosion of the wood. Um, this is a more simplistic, uh, simple uh, printmaking exercise called frottage. Has anybody done frottage? You just simply put a piece of paper on a texture and take a rubbing from it. Uh, but it's a very direct and very simple printmaking engagement with, with the texture and in this case with the natural object of the tree. 
and this is a, a kind of enormous print that the students in Argentina did um, of a tree, and it's printed on a on a kind of eco cloth. Um, the last uh, the last work I want to show you is by a, an Australian artist called Tim Mosley, and it's an artist book. So he found it uh, with a cover in it, and uh, if it's a book, if it's an art book, you as the viewer can turn the pages of the book. Uh, sometimes if you've got art up on the wall, there's no invitation to touch that, touch that print or touch that work. But if it's a book, you can engage with it by touch and create your own narrative and um, progression. So this book is um, a series of prints taken from tropical uh, plywood, which is, you see a lot of tropical plywood in Bangkok. And it relates to Tim Mosley's childhood because he was born in Papua New Guinea, uh, in the middle of nowhere, uh, in, a, in a forest um, uh, amongst the Samburidi people because his parents were missionaries. Um, and the book explores Mosley's tacit understanding of the rainforest and the use of touch as a means of communication. Um, um, the book exemplifies uh, the ideas of touch as a two and three way process where the wood the artist and the viewer exchange memory and information. Um, the book is called Kanage Polu Wanda, uh, which is the name of a young girl, uh, and the book is a, a memorial to that girl who used to live in the forest because uh, with uh, tree felling and logging, uh, that world amongst trees has gone. And he says, uh, her world has gone white, religious, and Western industrialization, industrialization have intervened and taken over through missionary experience and development and logging and mining. In a world where the machine moves forward, uh, nothing can go back. Okay. Um, yeah. yeah. Great. Thank you.